there and thank you so much for joining us as we take you around San Diego. I'm CBS 8's Jenny Day and I'll get you caught up on a week's worth of news and look ahead in just 30 minutes. Now, despite an increase in signage to try and prevent wrong way crashes on the highway from happening, two happened just hours apart last weekend. One fatal incident on Interstate 8 and another crash on the 163. The two wrong way drivers, a 33 year old man and a 24 year old woman, are facing felony charges. As CBS 8 Steve Price reports, officers say both of them were driving under the influence when they crashed. For years now, Caltrans has been trying to prevent wrong way drivers. Take a look at what they've done here at the end of Interstate 8. A flashing wrong way sign, a flashing do not enter sign, and those lights above it, they'll start flashing as soon as someone goes the wrong way. And yet, despite all of these precautions, it still keeps happening. And an update for that wrong way driver. They're still going westbound and eastbound lanes of the 1240 Saturday morning. 911 calls report a white Honda driving the wrong way on Interstate 8. Seconds later, this horrific crash. The driver of the other car was rushed to the hospital and later died. The Honda's driver survived. That driver is facing uh, murder charges and also facing DUI charges uh, on that crash. CHP officer Salvador Castro says investigators are still gathering details on that wrong way crash and this one, which happened Friday morning on the 163 near Robinson Avenue. So the details are still under investigation, but we do know that the driver was intoxicated uh, when he came out of downtown, crashed with another vehicle, seriously injuring four people that were in the car. It's still not clear where these drivers got on the freeway if they went past posted warnings. Caltrans wasn't able to comment today on the effectiveness of their efforts, but CHP officers believe in some cases they are saving lives. We do see that it works because it's more visibility. Uh, sometimes these drivers will turn, turn themselves around and go the right way. But Officer Castro says the problem is that there are too many drivers out there who are so drunk they don't notice anything. A lot of times they're not coherent to where they're at, and it's usually someone with a higher BAC that are that are driving the wrong way on the freeways. He says these crashes usually happen on weekends in the early morning hours. Thanks to a recent grant, the CHP is putting more officers on the streets right now during these times to try and stop drivers before things turn deadly. But he also warns others to stay alert when driving during the high risk hours and avoid the far left lane because that's where most of these crashes happen. Steve Price, CBS 8. Yeah, really scary, Steve. Thank you. We can do better. Well, now to an update on the El Cajon driving instructor accused of sexually assaulting female students. He has pleaded not guilty. 50 year old Richard Banks appeared in court on Tuesday. He's facing 33 counts of child abuse and molestation and possession of child porn, among other charges. Police say Banks used cameras hidden in the instructional car to record his students' private areas during their lessons. They say many of his victims were teen girls under the age of 18. San Diego police say they are still looking for more potential victims. If convicted, he faces up to 18 years in prison. And former National City school teacher Jacqueline Ma has pleaded not guilty to sexual misconduct charges with two students. Prosecutors say that messages between Ma and those students describe sex acts and also include explicit photographs. Tuesday's arraignment included enhancements to the initial charges, claiming the alleged acts were committed with victims under duress. Ma faces up to 165 years to life in state prison. Her trial is set to start on April 26th. And for the first time, we're hearing from a woman who lives in the El Cajon apartment complex where more than a dozen garages were destroyed in a fire just last week. Deputies arrested Mavis Williams early Sunday morning on suspicion of starting that fire. It broke out Thursday night in an apartment complex on East Bradley Avenue. The tenant we talked to says the property has been neglected for years. And I can't wait to get out of here. It's terrible here. They're just not taking care of it. Manager seems like she don't care. It's like the only time she comes is just to, around the first of the month to collect the rent. 
Authorities say the suspect was living with some other people inside one garage when that fire broke out. And take a look at this. Right now, this man is still on the loose after he was caught on security video breaking into a home in Carmel Valley. The owners of the home say that it happened last Saturday just before 6 p.m. No one was there at the time, and the footage shows the guy try a door handle. He then spots the camera and waves to it before turning it away. To me, he looked very confident, and he knew what he is doing, and he was not scared at all. So the owners say that his methods were similar to the band of burglars known as the South American Theft Group. He stacked outdoor furniture to climb to the second floor balcony and broke the window to a door leading to that master bedroom. The family says the thief took small, valuable items like jewelry. Please call police if you have any information. And a local man says that he was targeted by the TikTok Kia challenge after finding his car broken into. The owner believes that someone followed a TikTok video showing people how to steal some Hyundai and Kia vehicles. Thieves remove the steering column cover and use an iPhone cord to start the engine. He thinks it didn't work, though, for the thief, so they left his car damaged and took off. You always think it's not going to happen to you. And when it does, it really, like, basically just destroys you. Oh, yes. So from 2011 to 2022, 9 million Hyundai and Kia models were sold without immobilizers, meaning they don't require a key to start that engine. Now, jury selection is underway in the trial against a jail doctor and nurse accused of involuntary manslaughter in the death of a pregnant inmate. Potential jurors were screened this week in the trial against Dr. Frederick Von Ting and also nurse Dana Lee Pasqua at the El Cajon Courthouse. Both defendants are accused of negligence and face charges of involuntary manslaughter in the death of Elisa Serna in 2019. Cameras were not allowed inside that courtroom, but CBS 8 spoke with legal expert Mark Carlos, a defense attorney for 35 years who is not connected to this case. Anytime you have doctors who are accused of, uh, of omitting or, or, or somehow neglecting a duty to the level of criminal uh, culpability, that's a very, very serious case, and it's, and it's really difficult sometimes to prove. Yeah, in court, we also heard a list of potential witnesses. It included several nurses and members of law enforcement. If convicted, each defendant faces a maximum of four years behind bars. Well, a longtime landmark in Ocean Beach may soon be a piece of history. CBS 8's Ariana Cohen is at the Ocean Beach Pier. She talked with residents and tells us about a new notice that is now up on the pier's gate. It's known as the longest concrete pier on the West Coast, and this sign says an application has been filed by the city of San Diego for its demolition. It's pretty sad. Uh, you know, it's a landmark for Ocean Beach, and we just love it. Uh, it would be hard to imagine. Ocean Beach without the pier. This notice is attached to the Ocean Beach Pier Gate from the City of San Diego's Development Services Department. It reads, an application has been filed with the city for a site development permit for the historic designation, demolition, and replacement of the OB Pier. I spent many hours running on this pier, and I have seen how much the people of San Diego love this pier. Today I talked with Jeff Page. He's a longtime OB resident and rider for the OB RAG. So if they don't do something to shore up the deck, it could collapse into the ocean in that one spot. And just two weeks ago, the big waves and king tides knocked down one of its support pilings. That big piece of concrete across the top that looks like one piece is three pieces. And what happened was it broke in the middle. And I think that's why the, the pier piling failed. Over the past five years, the city has spent nearly $2 million on repairs. To those who love it, it feels like it's been closed forever. And I care about the pier. I love the pier. Of the neglect of the city is responsible for what we're looking at right now. Victor has been fishing at the pier since it first opened in 1966. Well, I was here when they opened it, and I walked all the way down to the end of the pier 
and I was the last man to walk off the pier. The city has been working on several new design options. The entire cost of a new pier has not been determined yet, but $8.4 million in state funding has been set aside for it. Page says the notice is a part of the permit process, and it could be a long time before we see anything happen. I think it's a wonderful asset, and everybody in the city loves it. If they never put a replacement in, I'd be disappointed. Ariana Cohen, CBS 8. Uh, yes, it is so beautiful. Excited to see what ends up happening there. Well, meantime, home sales saw a 21% drop last month compared to the previous year, according to new data from the Greater San Diego Association of Realtors. Prices also dipped for resale homes of single family homes to $949,000 last month. That's 3% lower than November. The median price for condos and townhomes dropped 2% to $650,000. Now, despite the drop in home sales, the association says now is a good time to buy for prospective homeowners. You can read more about the new report on CBS8.com. We want to thank the great people of Iowa. Thank you. We love you all. Yeah, really a landslide win in the Iowa caucus for former President Donald Trump. In the kickoff event of the 2024 presidential election, CBS News projects the former president captured 51% of the Republican vote. Now in the race for second place, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis beat former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, but just barely. Still, the next battleground state, New Hampshire, could shake that race up. Iowa is way more conservative than New Hampshire. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And we're taking it one step at a time. Iowa was very good to us, but we are super excited to be here in New Hampshire. Thank you for being here tonight. I want to first... So there are now two fewer candidates in the race. Entrepreneur Vivek Ramsaway suspended his campaign after finishing fourth. Now, as the 2024 presidential campaign ramps up, we are taking a closer look at how the Hispanic vote is going to impact the upcoming election. CBS 8's Kelly Hesedal reports from Barrio Logan. She talked with a Latino advocacy organization that says Hispanic voters are going to play a pivotal role. Overall, the Hispanic population is a younger population and the voting electorate is growing quickly. In fact, the Hispanic vote is expected to make up about 15 percent of all eligible voters in this next presidential election, which is a new high. And that's the main thing is just trying to find groceries where, you, you know, affordable groceries in the, in the area. And Rosanna Rubio is from Barrio Logan and says the economy is the number one priority for her in this upcoming presidential election. It's a beautiful neighborhood and I just want to see um, people be able to, um, the people that have lived here for generations, be able to stay and afford um, to live. Inflation, rising housing prices, and wages ranked number one with Hispanic voters, according to Unidos U.S., the nation's largest Latino civil rights organization. Clarissa Martinez is vice president of the group's Latino Vote Initiative. They're a growing community nationwide, and so particularly in an environment of razor-thin margins deciding many of the races we're going to be seeing in November, Latinos are going to play a decisive role in places not just like California and Texas and Florida, the places with the largest Latino population, but also in places like North Carolina, Georgia, Nevada, and certainly Arizona, which is now a very significant battleground state. She says the candidates from both parties need to do a better job in reaching Hispanic voters. So if you look at 2024, one in every five Latino voters will be voting in a presidential election for the first time. So that really means candidates and parties need to make sure that these voters are hearing from them, that they understand their positions, and above all, that they understand their solutions. For North Park resident Stephen Arturo Greenlaw, this is what's important to him. Action on climate change, immigration, also, um, what's happening right now in Palestine. He says he's still undecided about who he'll vote for this fall. And Martinez points out that the presidential election isn't the only race that matters come November. She says the Latino vote here in California will play a big role in deciding the balance of power in Congress. Kelly Hassett, CBS 8. 
Yeah, and California voters will soon decide whether to overhaul the state's mental health system by voting on Proposition 1. One of the primary goals of Prop 1 is to update California's Mental Health Services Act, which was signed into law two decades ago. Supporters say our state's behavioral health crisis is very different from 20 years ago, so how we fund it needs to change. This measure would also create a $6.4 billion bond, which would be used to fund 11,000 new behavioral health beds, as well as create more housing for the homeless. If we're really going to tackle the homelessness crisis, we have to invest in behavioral health, and Prop 1 does just that. Yet critics say that Prop 1 would divert funding from current behavioral health services. Voters will be heading to the polls to vote on Tuesday, March 5th. Now, a proposed law that would ban youth tackle football for kids under 12 is moving through the state capitol, but the governor warns that he could veto it. In Sacramento on Wednesday, Pop Warner parents and coaches protested AB 734, which would be the first ban of its kind in the nation. CBS 8's Abby Black talked with local families and coaches who are huddling up to flag the ban. Scripps Ranch Pop Warner football plays on the same field as Scripps Ranch High. Parents and the team president say it's a bad call to ban youth tackle football. It's been six years. Today from the state capitol. Of fighting Sacramento. To San Diego. Ultimately, we just ask that uh, we respect the rights of the families and the athletes to make this decision on themselves. Who's my tailback? Pop Warner football parents and coaches are flagging a proposed law that would ban kids 12 and under from playing tackle football. These teams are second family to these kids but it's also kind of a second home. Sacramento Assemblymember Kevin McCarty authored the bill that must pass the House by the end of January to make it to the Senate for a vote. He tried to pass a similar law in 2018, but it failed. I love football. Five, six, seven, eight, eleven-year-old um, should not be experiencing hundreds of sub-concussive hits to the head on an annual basis when there is an alternative. In 2021, the CDC published a report that found youth football athletes ages 6 to 14 sustained 15 times more head impacts than flag football athletes. Parents of professional players who suffered chronic brain injuries testified in support of the ban. Football must be played in a manner that enriches and not destroys the brains and lives of our children. But the bill may not make it far. Governor Newsom says that he would not support an outright ban. In a statement he sent to CBS 8, he wrote in part, my administration will work with the legislature and the bill's author to strengthen safety in youth football while ensuring parents have the freedom to decide which sports are most appropriate for their children. The sport has never been safer than it is today. In 2019, Newsom signed the California Youth Football Act, which set some of the strictest rules for youth football, including limiting the amount of contact during practice. The president for Scripps Ranch Pop Warner says that they've not experienced significant injuries in their program. At this age of football, uh, the kids aren't as big and fast and strong, so it's a, it's a relatively safe sport uh, when it's taught right shot the right way. The Scripps Ranch Pop Warner mom admits that she was nervous for her 10 year old to start tackle football, but says it's about trusting the coaches, the parents and the kids to decide. I think if the kids feel safe and the parents feel like their kids are going to be safe, I think you know, it should be left to the, the parents. To see. In Scripps Ranch, Abby Black, CBS 8. Yeah, interesting debate, Abby, thank you. Well, a retired San Diego fire captain who served more than four decades at the department remains in the intensive care unit after he was rescued from a burning vehicle back in November. Edward Cardenas suffered a heart attack while in his SUV outside of his home. His daughter says he was unconscious but had his foot on the gas, so the vehicle hit a fence and then that trailer caught fire, trapping Cardenas inside the burning vehicle. She says that his fellow firefighters had to cut the SUV to get him out. Cardenas suffered burns on nearly 40% of his body. He is being treated in the burn unit at the UC San Diego Regional Burn Center. My dad uh, is resilient. He's always been a fighter. And, and really, even in this situation, we know he continues to fight. Yeah, the family has put together a GoFundMe account to help cover medical expenses. His daughter says they didn't want to ask the public for help, but feel they have no choice. If you would like to help out, just go to our website, cbs8.com. 
And this week, the Regional Task Force on Homelessness will hold its annual point in time count. Volunteers will go block by block, counting the amount of people living on the streets or in their cars. Right now, organizers are still looking for volunteers to cover the whole county. The last monthly count in December 2023 found more than 1,800 people were homeless in downtown San Diego. This year's count will be the first since San Diego banned most homeless camps. Organizers tell CBS 8 they are now expecting to find more people living elsewhere now, like riverbeds or canyons. They're trying to find shelter, and with the encampment ban, they're just being reshuffled to other parts of San Diego County. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. Yeah, now this yearly count helps secure federal funding to help the homeless and map where people need the most help. Well, we are also putting a face on San Diego's homelessness crisis. CBS 8's Jasmine Ramirez met a young unsheltered couple one year ago, and she now shares where they are in their journey in getting back on their feet. Exactly one year ago, this couple was living on the streets. Now they've had many highs and lows, but say they're not losing hope. We're trying to get off the streets. I met Marcos de la Sierra on a rainy day last January. Despite having a full-time job, Marcos and his pregnant wife, Ariel, were facing homelessness for the first time. We were struggling out here, freezing and overwhelmed, and I'm not giving up. Tonight, we checked back in with them and met the newest member of their family, a nine-month-old baby boy. He's just so adorable, and he really is the fuel to my fire. Now their family is staying at Father Joe's Villages. They secured a spot there in the spring after months of living on the street and occasionally securing temporary hotel vouchers. I appreciate everything that's happening for us right now and um, I'm just, I'm just, God is good. God is great and I wouldn't be here if I wasn't for him. Can't believe us. Marcos got his food vendor license and is selling snacks in East Village. I'm hoping Father Joe's Villages could uh, see that I'm actually working, trying to build something out of my life, especially being homeless. It's not an excuse. It's just that I'm just hoping that I get some more love. The process up until now hasn't been easy. Their time at Father Joe's comes to an end this April, and they fear what might come next. I just hope that the city of San Diego realizes that there's families out here trying to make it. They say many shelters only accept single men or women with children, but don't allow entire families. Permanent housing opportunities are very limited and have long wait lists in order of who applies first. Their family believed they'd been on a wait list, but recently learned that wasn't the case. You got people like me who's a working class American, a San Diegan, native who is just hit rock bottom and needs help and the programs are not really helping like they should. Marcos and his wife aren't strangers to challenges. They both grew up in foster care right here in San Diego. Their future now is uncertain, but they're holding hope things will work out. God's really leading me. He helped me build my business. He gave me a beautiful baby son and uh, I just got to keep following this road and, and pray that it pays off. Jasmine Ramirez, CBS 8. Yeah, Jasmine, thank you for sharing their story. Well, extreme weather, you know it, in other parts of the country really could impact what you pay at the grocery store. A professor of economics at the University of San Diego says the weather will impact beef prices because cattle are not eating as much in the storm. Crops could soon be impacted as well. Weather-related uh, impacts have been rated the number one a potential disruptor in terms of supply chain for, for 2024. I just saw a study that said that in the 1980s, there was a billion dollar event affecting the U.S. economy every four months. Now it's a billion dollar event every three weeks, uh, weather related occurring then uh, in the U.S. Yeah, FedEx has posted alerts letting customers know there may be a delay in deliveries nationwide due to those weather disruptions. And this week marked 30 years since the devastating 6.7 magnitude Northridge earthquake. CBS 8 Shannon Handy takes a look back at images from that day and explains what's changed since then. The Northridge earthquake was so powerful, it was felt here in San Diego. 30 years later, a lot has changed, including the way structures are built and how and when to alert people. Well, the Northridge earthquake was a tremendously powerful event. It was January 17th, 1994 at 4.31 a.m. Geologist Pat Abbott was inside his San Carlos home when a strong jolt woke him up. 
was really surprised even more when we learned that the earthquake movement was actually to the north, away from San Diego. The 6.7 magnitude earthquake centered in Northridge near Los Angeles. It lasted less than 20 seconds, yet caused devastation that's taken decades to recover from. Nearly 60 people were killed and damages totaled in the tens of billions of dollars. Freeway bridges collapsed, apartment buildings collapsed onto parking lots, 500 fires got started. Abbott says a lot of lessons were learned in its aftermath, leading to significant changes. Retrofitting is one of the biggest things. We now recognize that buildings standing up on steel poles are going to collapse. That's what we call a soft first story. So we have retrofitting in those buildings, more retrofitting in masonry, brick buildings, things that are real rigid. Other structures, such as freeway overpasses and bridges, have also been retrofitted. Building codes for new projects have transformed as well. It's a lot easier to upgrade building a codes before a building has been built than it is to try to get people to go back to retrofit because a lot of times the retrofit expense is more than the building is worth. Earthquake, earthquake. On top of that, advanced technology has allowed experts to alert people at least a few seconds before an earthquake's waves reach their location using an early warning system called Shake Alert. If you're at the epicenter, you're on your own. The farther away you are, the more warning you get. Together, all of these advancements have helped save lives, but Abbott warns there are certain things not under our control. For starters, there's no way to predict exactly when an earthquake will hit. And here in San Diego, potential damage such as sea cliff collapses can't be prevented either. Still, he says if that happens, we're more prepared than ever before. In terms of retrofitting, the state of California now offers grants to help homeowners do just that. To see if you qualify, log on to CBS8.com and click on the story. For CBS8, I'm Shannon Handy. Appreciate you, Shannon. Thank you. Well, a recent study came out about the levels of harmful chemicals in practically everything we eat. This certainly concerning to many of us, including CBS 8's Neda Aranpour. She set out to get all of those details, talking to a local researcher about her insight and really the shocking findings on plastic in this Earth 8 report. According to the latest consumer reports, a chemical known as phthalates, so common in our food, it might as well be considered an ingredient. But you don't see the word phthalates usually on any list like this. Because according to a local researcher, those who create plastic products don't have to disclose all they use to create this. That's something Kara Wigan hopes to change as she works to advocate for more transparency. We have this chemical burden in our food that humans may not know that they're being exposed to every day. Kara Wigan is a researcher at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Her focus on plastics. It's been really fascinating, very frustrating. And it's finally getting the attention she believes it deserves. Kara recently went to Dubai with a team from UC San Diego to speak on the topic at the UN Climate Change Conference as plastic in our environment gains recognition for all the wrong reasons. They really are toxic. We don't even really know how toxic they truly are. She's referring to phthalates found in many plastics. Basically, these are plasticizers, which are chemicals that are put into plastic to make them more flexible, which is often what our food products are wrapped in. The plasticizers help make plastic do things like this, be really flexible, bendy, your oat milk, Greek yogurt, you'll see it in peanut butter, even things like fruits and vegetables wrapped in this type of plastic. These chemicals are actually not molecularly bound to the plastic, which means they're not sort of attached to the molecular structure that makes up the plastic, which means they can just free float. Take this box of Cheerios, for example. It has this plastic bag inside the cardboard box. Now, because of this plastic bag, according to Consumer Reports, a serving of Cheerios has about 11,000 nanograms of phthalates. So I did some math here. If you have a bowl of cereal every day for 10 years, that'll equal about 40 million nanograms of phthalates. That's about 40 milligrams. That equals about 40 grains of salt, which may not sound like much at all, but consider this. That latest report also says there are phthalates in most packaged foods. There is a bit of good news. Our body can process and metabolize and get rid of these chemicals pretty fast. I think some studies say about two days. But the not so good news is we're exposed every day and nearly all we do. So our body doesn't have the chance to clear plasticizers out of our system. And now studies show they hurt our health.
what we know for sure is that they're decreasing male, male fertility over time, especially when you're exposed through your entire life. Kara points out it's especially important to reduce exposure to babies since they're most sensitive to reproductive changes. The U.S. is phasing out phthalates from children's toys, so at least that's something. Legislation around the world really needs to ban them or at least start phasing them down. For Earth 8, I'm Netta Iranpour. Uh, truly so important, Netta, thank you. And plasticizers are not just in our food. They are also in our beauty products as well. Lotion, makeup, and shampoo. Right now, researchers are working on alternatives to plasticizers. In the meantime, you may want to consider buying in bulk or from farmer's markets instead of packaged foods. Hey, and before we go, get ready to dance in the desert. Coachella has unveiled this year's music festival lineup, and it features a surprise reunion by no doubt. It will mark the band's first live performance in almost a decade. They are one of the four headlining acts. Lana Del Rey, Doja Cat, and rapper Tyler, the creator, are the others. The festival will return to Indio for back-to-back -back weekends in mid-April. As always, thank you for your time. Thank you for staying informed. For CBS 8, I'm Jenny Day. Take such good care.